parasites. They're all around us, from birds' nests to litter boxes to our brains. They can be surprisingly helpful, but plenty of them are harmful to the health of animals like us. Should we be worried about that? Well, I mean, some parasites aren't so bad to have around, and some of the organisms that live in our bodies are even good. So first, if you're wondering what I could possibly mean by good parasite, here's 2012 Hank with some examples of the good, the bad, and the not-so-influential parasites. So parasite, it's a strong word. Technically, a parasite is any organism that makes its living off of another organism. And sometimes they're bad, and sometimes they're not. Parasitism is a pretty clever strategy. They just sort of sneak in, they set up camp inside of, of a body, and then uh, they can devour it from the inside out. Or they might not do any significant harm at all, or they might even help their host animal. There are many animals living inside of me right now that are actually helping me live a happy, healthy life. And there are also a bunch that I just don't notice and are completely unobtrusive. So I'm gonna talk about these good guys first. And then a little later on, I'm gonna scare the adenoids out of your face by talking about those supervillain parasites that you do not want. So animals that live, you know, inside of another animal, but actually help them, those are called mutualistic symbiotic relationships. And that's roughly the relationship that we have with the 100 trillion microbes that are living inside of us at any given moment. So 100 trillion, hard to really wrap your mind around that number. As scale, a uh, number of cells that you have with your DNA in them, in your body, about 10 trillion. I'm gonna say this again for you. There are 10 times more bacteria cells in your body than you cells. Do your best not to let this freak you out, because those are really, really important little animals living in you, and they make your life way better. Some scientists are going so far as to call this the human microbiome. <laughs> We're our own biome. So much so that some scientists have gone so far as to name this human microbiome, that is the ecosystem of animals that lives inside of us, our forgotten organ. So, what are these things doing to earn their keep? Well, I'm glad you asked that. They kill harmful bacteria in our noses, they form a protective coating on our skin, and the vast majority of them live in our intestines. Doing really useful stuff like helping us break down the food that we can't digest by ourselves, making vitamins biologically available to us, teaching our immune systems not to freak the frick out over stuff that doesn't matter, and killing off the harmful bacteria that often find their way into our guts. Without them, our lives would be miserable, and I'm not going to tell you how miserable, I'm just going to say that adult diapers would be involved. They're so important that doctors are now diagnosing people with bad gut bacteria. And they're putting good gut bacteria in to the people through what's called fecal transplants, which is exactly what it sounds like. I talk about it more in my obesity video. But not all of the animals that live inside us are super good awesome animals. Some of them are just Meh. We provide a lot of food and transportation and lodging for a lot of animals that basically do absolutely nothing to us. This is called commensal symbiosis, when one of the participants benefits and the other one, it doesn't care. An example of this being the eyelash mite or follicle mite that basically lives anywhere that there's hair on your face. Basically these tiny little arthropods just hang onto the base of your hair follicle and eat the oils that are excreted by your sebaceous glands, and that might seem gross and sort of not cool to you, but it's not really affecting you in any way, so I suggest you just deal with it. Besides, you're gonna have to save your big freakout guns for where we're headed to right now. Be advised, the rest of this video is moderately gross and may not be suitable for all audiences, especially those who suffer from delusional parasitosis, which, by the way, is a real thing. Objectively, parasites are pretty awesome. I mean, they're tiny, generally, but they're scheming and they're clever and they can take down an animal much, 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 much bigger than it. Parasites that feed on humans, the bad sort of parasites, can be organized into a few different groups. We have the protozoans, the worms, the crawly bugs, and category number four, freaky stuff. So let's start with the protozoans. Now, protozoa, which you may have heard of, are one-celled organisms, a lot of which can kind of move around on their own, get into the host through drinking contaminated water, or through the saliva of a tick or a mosquito that bites you, etc. And once these bad guys are in your gut, or your blood, or whatever, their single mission is to take you down. Take, for instance, Neglaria fowleri, also known as the brain-eating amoeba. This guy is found in bodies of fresh water that stay pretty warm all year. And this is why I live in Montana. So basically this little guy spots you swimming around in some tepid lake or river somewhere and 
crawls over to you and wiggles its way right up your nose. From there, it works up to the olfactory bulbs of your forebrain and starts to feed on your nerve tissue. And then your brain starts to swell up and then 98% of the time you die. In 2011, two people died because they were using contaminated water to irrigate their sinuses with neti pots. So always remember to boil your neti pot water. Especially if you live in Louisiana. Anyway, there are a bunch of other diseases that you've probably heard of that are caused by a parasitic amoeba, African sleeping sickness, giardia, malaria, toxoplasmosis. And this brings us to the second type of parasite, the worms, which are arguably the worst. These are the ones which I highly recommend you do not Google, because parasitic worms are in it to win it. And when I say win it, I mean breed so many worms that they fill your whole body up and start coming out your nose or your butt. So good news, if you live in the developed world and you have like power outlets and hot water and an internet connection, you probably don't have any chance of getting any of these worms. But many people in the developing world have to deal with these kinds of things every single day because they don't have access to clean food and water like we do. They're more likely, because of lack of plumbing, to be in more contact with human feces and they live in a part of the world where a mosquito bite can lead to elephantiasis. Ah yes, elephantiasis, or lymphatic filariasis, an infectious tropical disease caused by parasitic roundworms that are passed from person to person through mosquitoes. The worms can cause unbelievably horrifying amounts of swelling in the legs, arms, breasts, and genitals of their victims. Elephantiasis, it turns out, is one of the leading causes of disability worldwide. So the next type of parasite, of course, is the crawly bugs, which is my classification for parasites that feed on you from the outside, like your bed bugs, or your scabies, or your body lice, or your genital crabs, that kind of thing. Now, in my opinion, these things are, are way better than, than the worms or the protozoa, because they're, just, they're way less likely to kill you, but they are pretty gross. In fact, just talking about them, Makes me feel like there's things crawling on me. And this is where the word delusional parasitosis comes in. Uh, that, that, that disease, which has nothing to do with parasites, except that you think you have them because you've been hearing about them and it makes your skin crawl. And finally, we have number four, our last category of parasites, the freaky ones. And there are lots of other kinds of parasites as well, of course, like the botfly, which lays its eggs under your skin where they hatch and then feed on you until they're ready to uh, erupt as it were. And then there's the Kandiru, a tiny parasitic catfish that lives in the Amazon River and loves the smell of urine. If you're in the Amazon River and peeing, which I suggest you do not do, the Kandiru may sniff you out, swim up your urethra, and camp out there until it is surgically removed. And these, my friends, are the tenants of your body. And I hope that you have them, the good ones at least, and the bad ones, well, let's just get them away from us. I have some good news. We learned more about the Kandiru since filming this video and made another video all about how very unlikely it is that you could have a fish swim up your urethra. Yay! But what other intimate locations are these parasites trying to nestle into? How about an animal's nest, right next to the animal's own babies? Here's how parasites infiltrate a nursery and how some birds manage to stay wise to these parasitic ways. Raising kids is a big job, and one that costs a lot of energy. But what if you could just drop your kids off at someone else's place and let them have the responsibility? Well, there are some animals that do just that. They're called brood parasites, and they lay their eggs in other animals' nests and let them do all the hard work. There's a kind of evolutionary arms race between these hosts and parasites. Hosts try to remove parasite eggs from their nests, but the parasite species often have ways to trick hosts into keeping them. The cuckoo catfish, for example, is a brood parasite of cichlids, a family of diverse fish found around the world that rear their young in their mouths. The cuckoo catfish is what's known as an obligate parasite, meaning that they're no longer capable of raising their own young. When the female cichlid lays her eggs, the catfish quickly swims in, eats some of them, and deposits her own eggs. The cichlid then scoops up the catfish's eggs along with her remaining brood and takes care of all of them in her mouth until they hatch. But the cichlid's eggs won't be around for long. The young catfish hatch first, and eat them. Then the mother cichlid takes care of the catfish's babies. She has no idea that they are not hers. The cuckoo paper wasp does something similar, leaving its eggs in the nest of other species of paper wasp. Cuckoo wasps are also obligate parasites, so if the queen can't find a host nest, she won't lay any eggs that season. If she is successful, though, her larvae actually attract more attention from host workers than their own larvae. Scientists think the parasites somehow give the we're hungry signal more often and more forcefully than the host larvae. That signal is very important for a young wasp. 
wasp. When they grow up, the ones that are fed the most will be reproducers instead of workers. You might have noticed that all the examples we've talked about so far have cuckoo in their names. That's because cuckoo birds, like the recurring character Dino over on SciShow Kids, are probably the most famous brood parasites. The European common cuckoo is especially well known for leaving its eggs in other birds' nests. Cuckoo birds, like the cuckoo wasp and catfish, also can't take care of their own young, so their only hope of successful reproduction is to rely on their hosts. This sneaky bird looks a lot like a raptor, so it scares away the host birds for long enough to drop an egg in their nest and leave. If the parasitic egg isn't detected and pushed out of the nest by the host bird, then once it hatches, it'll push the host's eggs out of the nest. It'll even push out the host chicks if they've already hatched. The adults don't seem to notice, or if they do, there's nothing they can do about it, so few if any of the host's chicks survive. Another type of bird, the parasitic honey guide chick, will take this one step further. It'll actually stab the host chicks to death with its beak. But the host parent bird can easily toss an egg out of a nest, so why don't host birds get rid of the intruders? Well, sometimes they do. Pied wagtails and red-faced cysticolas, for example, are experts at spotting eggs that don't belong to them and will throw them out of their nests. But some cuckoos have eggs that look like their host's eggs, so the host bird might not realize the invading egg is there. Some host birds have other options. Reed warbler communities try to stop brood parasites from invading in the first place by using alarm calls to warn their neighbors when cuckoos are nearby. Superb fairy wrens use a much more complicated tactic. They teach their chicks a secret password while the chicks are still in their eggs. Each female has a unique call that they share with their eggs, and when the chicks hatch, they use the same call. The cuckoo chicks that invade the wren nests can't replicate the call, so they don't get fed. But for the host bird, sometimes it's not even worth trying to get rid of the brood parasites. In some species of cuckoo and in the brown-headed cowbird, if the host bird removes the parasite's eggs, the invading parent bird will come back and destroy the host's eggs. So the host can raise the cuckoo's chicks and hope that at least one of its own chicks makes it to adulthood, or it can risk losing everything. Talk about high-stakes parenting. Like European changeling folklore, these animals don't always realize that their own offspring have been replaced by parasite babies. Truly nightmare fuel. Now the next level of nightmares on our list are fueled by parasites that take over the bird's mind so they can't fight back anymore. That process looks like this. Oh, did you not know that there are parasites that, that can take over your brain? So, well, here's the thing. So some parasites aren't content to just set up shop and, and like consume the body of their host. They need their host to do something specific to continue their life cycle. And because parasites are so crafty, they can do this by uh, taking over the brains of their hosts. Take, for example, the green banded brood sac, a kind of worm that likes to live inside of birds. But in order to get into a bird, it has to first get into a bird's food. And this is where the snail comes in. Certain snails love to eat bird poop. You know, to each his own. And bird poop is, you know, where green banded brood sac larvae end up after infecting a bird. So a snail strolls by and sees, oh, awesome, some delicious bird crap sitting on a leaf. But little does it know that that poo has a baby little worm larva in it that's going to hijack its brain, turn it into a zombie, and drive its body around like a go kart. The worm uses the snail to create this unbelievable scene just to get the attention of the bird. Basically, the worm will drive its zombie snail to a conspicuous location where a bird is sure to see it, and then it jams itself up into the snail's eye tentacle and puts on a laser show, making the snail's head look like a giant delicious maggot. So a bird eats the snail and the whole cycle starts over. But I'll see you one of those and raise you a hair worm. These little Bastards work their way into insects like grasshoppers through the water that the insects are drinking and they live inside of those insects until they are fully grown. But when it's time for these hairworms to mate, they need to get back into the water. And so, you know what it does? It secretes proteins that interfere with the grasshopper's brain chemistry, overrides its entire existence, every fiber of its being, and commands the grasshopper to commit suicide. It makes the grasshopper jump into the nearest body of water where it drowns, and the worm is super happy, crawls out of its butthole, and goes on to mate with other disgusting butthole worms. Fortunately for us, not a lot of parasites are able to deal with the marvelously complicated thing that we've got sitting on top of our necks. Oh, but there is there's this one thing. So there's this protozoan called Toxoplasma gondii, which we're just gonna call Toxo for short. Cats poop out the Toxo babies, but then cats don't eat cat poop because that would be gross, unlike dogs. But the things that do eat cat poop, for whatever reason, turn out to be rats. But then the Toxo has a problem of how to get from the rat back into a cat. So the Toxo interferes with the brain chemistry of the rat and switches off the little lever that says, do not go near cats. Cats will eat you. And instead, it tells the rat brain, 
You love the cats. You love those kitty, aren't they? They're so charming and adorable. Wouldn't you just like to to spoon a cat? The first time a rat tries to spoon a cat, you know what happens? It gets chomped and success. But here's the thing: people also spend a lot of time around cats, and we're actually pretty similar to rats when it comes to brain chemistry. As upsetting as that might be. And there is research that suggests that the gigantic jump in cases of schizophrenia in the mid to late 19th century uh, occurred at the same time as a gigantic jump in cat ownership. Indeed, some studies have shown a link between the amount of toxo and the amount of schizophrenia, suggesting that this little jerk might be interfering with human brain chemistry. As if we needed another reason to never eat poop. But as long as you're not sitting down to a dinner of your cat's poop, then you'll be safe from toxoplasmosis, right? Well, those parasites might be more common than you think. Here's more on how they can affect our brains from our SciShow Psych channel. Now this is a common stereotype. The single lady who lives next door and you hear the meows echoing through the walls, or maybe it's your aunt or grandma with a whole clowder of cats. Whoever it is, she is known as the crazy cat lady. And stereotypes or not, there could be some actual psychological risks from hanging around so many kitties if just one of them is harboring a parasite. See, there's a parasite that sexually produces only inside cats, and it's called Toxoplasma gondii. And if that parasite gets into a human, it can result in a full-blown infection called toxoplasmosis, which could be bad news for your body and your mind. T. gondii have really tough eggs, and when animals like rats or birds eat them, even just through contaminated water, they become intermediate hosts. Once that bird or rat makes its way inside of a cat, however, that happens, in the kitty's gut, the parasite will mature, mate, and sexually reproduce. And eventually, the cat will poop out more eggs, which continues the cycle. In a human or other intermediate host, T. gondii can still hatch, but only reproduce asexually. They're dangerous, though, because parasites can enter your bloodstream and infect almost any kind of cell, including immune cells. An immune cell is like a Trojan horse, letting T. gondii sneak around and invade more specialized tissues, like muscle cells and brain cells. Once parasites Parasites get into your central nervous system, they can hide out in cysts and infect you for life. But you might not show any symptoms, or if you do, it's just like a mild flu. Some estimates say over a third of all humans have toxoplasmosis without knowing it. As a human's immune system gets weaker over time, the parasitic cysts can cause some more severe symptoms. An infected person can develop muscle weakness, poor coordination, seizures, or permanent damage to the brain and eyes which is not great. And if a pregnant woman is infected, she could pass the parasites on to her baby. On top of that, there's evidence that links T. gondii infection to psychological conditions, too. One study monitored the mental health of nearly 46,000 women from Denmark who had their newborn babies screened for T. gondii antibodies, which were passed on. The researchers then followed up on the mother's medical and psychiatric information for up to 14 years and found that infected women seemed to have more risk of depression, anxiety, and self-harm later in life. Many studies suggest that T. gondii affects how a couple of different neurotransmitters work, too. These are the chemicals that travel between neurons all over the body, not just in the brain. And when neurotransmitters get imbalanced, that can lead to physical and mental illnesses. One 2011 mouse study from the University of Leeds showed that T. gondii infection in brain cells led to higher dopamine levels because the parasite makes an enzyme that controls how dopamine is made. Dopamine helps regulate parts of the brain tied to pleasure, mostly the amygdala and the nucleus accumbens. But too much dopamine flooding the brain has been linked with illnesses that distort thoughts and moods, like psychosis, schizophrenia, and bipolar disorder. A more recent study in 2016 showed that T. gondii infection can also mess up a protein that transports glutamate, which is usually an excitatory neurotransmitter that makes neurons more easily activated. Failed transporters lead to a glutamate buildup in the space between neurons all over the nervous system, like a chemical traffic jam. This is called excitotoxicity, and it basically overstimulates the nerve cells, causing parts of them to go haywire and start breaking down. So dysregulation of glutamate is linked with neurodegenerative diseases like ALS, multiple sclerosis, Parkinson's, and Alzheimer's. And another study from 2012 found that parasite-hijacked immune cells start releasing a bunch of GABA. GABA is usually an inhibitory neurotransmitter, which means it can keep neurons from firing as much. When it interacts with the amygdala, for instance, GABA can help control feelings of fear and anxiety. So way too much GABA could presumably make someone feel 
fearless, like how severely infected mice seem to be less afraid of cats, and get eaten more often. That way the parasites can continue their life cycles. But even with all this research, other studies have suggested that there isn't a significant association between toxoplasmosis and mental disorders. A study from Duke University took blood samples from just over 800 people to look for T. gondii antibodies, and did other surveys and tests to collect data about their behavior. About 28% of their participants tested positive for parasite antibodies, but the researchers didn't find a significant association with schizophrenia, depression, or other mental disorders, or any link to impulsive activities like crime or car accidents. So research in this field is tricky, because animal models like mice aren't entirely comparable to humans, but it'd also be super unethical to do controlled experimental studies on humans, like giving people toxoplasmosis and monitoring their brains. But there is no reason to ditch your cats. They bring happiness and cuddles. There is so many positive health outcomes associated with having a fuzzy thing in your house. Just be careful around their poop, like make sure it doesn't go in your mouth. Try to keep them from eating mice and birds, uh, if that's possible. And make sure your food is cooked properly so you don't accidentally eat any uncooked parasite eggs. All right, so I guess I'll just get a dog instead of a cat, and then I'll be safe from parasites, right? Well, not so fast. If you have a dog, you probably give them heartworm medication to keep them healthy. Well, heartworms are also parasites. And you guessed it, humans can get heartworms too. Here's how it happens and why you might not have known about human heartworms. If you're a dog owner, chances are you've heard of heartworm disease. And if you aren't familiar with it, well, Brace yourself for some serious nightmare fuel. It's basically exactly what it sounds like. An infestation of worms, collectively known as dirofilaria, in a dog's heart. These parasitic nematodes are transmitted by mosquitoes, and different species are found all over the world. The most common in North America is dirofilaria emetis. The adult parasites live and reproduce in the dog's pulmonary arteries, eventually clogging the chambers in the right side of the heart. This leads to all kinds of nasty complications like fatigue, coughing up blood, and ultimately, heart failure. And usually, if your dog has enough worms to show symptoms, getting rid of them is really hard. That's why vets encourage pet owners to use preventative medications that decrease their risk of infection and lessen the spread of disease. And it turns out that lowering the risk of transmission is good for dogs and people because humans can be infected with heartworm too. Now, before you freak out too much, heartworm infections in people don't cause symptoms nearly as bad as they do in dogs. And they're super rare. Fewer than 120 cases have been reported in the United States since 1941. The main difference is that our immune systems aren't as easily tricked by the worms. You see, when a mosquito bites an animal with a heartworm infection, they suck up microfilariae the earliest larval stage of the worm. Those mature through their next larval stages inside the mosquito, and then migrate to its proboscis, the stabby part it uses to suck up blood and arguably its least endearing feature. When that mosquito goes for another blood meal, be it from a dog or human, the larvae bust out and get onto the skin. Then they, no joke, crawl around until they find a way in, like the tiny hole made by the mosquito. From there, they have to wiggle their way through the skin tissue to get into small blood vessels so they can travel around the bloodstream, eventually making their way to the pulmonary arteries and the lungs. Inside the body, they grow and mature for about six months until finally, the mature worms reproduce and release their little microfilariae back into the bloodstream, starting the whole process over again. Now, where dogs and humans differ is that, usually, the larvae never make it into the bloodstream. This is probably because the larvae transmitted by the mosquito are in their third stage of development, or the L3 stage. And studies of human infections with related species of nematodes have shown that our immune system is really good at recognizing and mounting a response against parasites when they're at this stage. In fact, this is probably why human heartworm infections are considered rare to begin with. It's not that we're rare infected, it's just that we rarely stay infected long enough for anyone to notice. So sometimes, a rogue larva does find its way into a person's lungs. But even when this happens, the worm never gets a chance to grow and reproduce the way it would in dogs. The immune system always spots it and sends cells to destroy it. This destruction process forms nodules in the lung tissue, which is usually how we end up figuring out that someone had heartworm infection. These nodules, called coin lesions, are rarely harmful. They're mostly just annoying because other, deadlier conditions also cause them, so doctors have to take them seriously. As for why our immune systems always end up finding and killing those worms, 
Well, it probably has as much to do with bacteria as it does with the parasite itself. Filarial nematodes like Dirofilaria have an intimate partnership with bacteria called Wolbachia. The bacteria live inside the worm's cells, and it's a mutually beneficial relationship. The worms provide the bacteria with amino acids for growth, while the Wolbachia are essential for the development of the worm's larvae. And the bacteria also play an important role in the parasite's ability to infect a host animal. Proteins produced by Wolbachia cause the host's immune system to start fighting a bacterial infection, a type of immune response called a Th1 response, even though there isn't a bacterial infection going on. Now, here's why this is important. Th1 responses are counterbalanced by immune responses called Th2 responses. They basically do opposite things. Th1 responses promote inflammation, while Th2 responses dampen it. So the presence of Wolbachia can shift the immune system toward more of a Th1 response, but the Th2 responses are what our immune systems use to attack worms. So by inducing the Th1 response, the bacteria seem to essentially distract the immune system, allowing the worms to sneak around and proliferate. Some scientists even think a strong Th1 response helps the larval worms grow and mature. Also, dogs really get the short end of the stick here, because studies have shown that Th1 response is increased when the host has more microfilariae in their system. So once a few worms have set up shop and started breeding, the dog's immune system gets even worse at fighting them off. So humans can totally be infected with heartworm, but the reason the disease hits dogs way harder has to do with how our different immune systems react to the worms and their bacterial allies. And that's why it's really important to talk to your vet about heartworm meds for your pets. Your furry friends will breathe a little easier, and so, presumably, will you. So these parasites don't usually affect us much as long as we have a strong immune response. So I've talked about terrifying parasites and parasites you don't even know you have, but let's finish on a high note with some good parasites. If your doctor told you that you were infected with worms, your first question would probably be, how quickly can I get rid of those worms in me? And I get that. I mean, look, you don't want worms wiggling around inside your intestines. It's enough to gross anybody out. But what if I told you that you might want to have parasitic worms inside you. Because some doctors have found a connection between having worms and not having immune system problems like allergies or arthritis. The idea is that these worms have set up shop in our bodies for so long, evolutionarily speaking, that our immune systems might have gotten used to them, to the point that being worm-free can actually cause its own issues. It's part of the hygiene hypothesis, which was proposed by epidemiologists back in the 1980s to explain why allergies and autoimmune conditions like asthma are so much more common today than they used to be. According to the hypothesis, people's immune systems might be out of whack because we're too clean. Filtered water didn't exist for an awful long time, let alone hand sanitizer stations. So for much of our evolutionary history, everyone was constantly exposed to things like bacteria and parasites. It's your immune system's job to keep these things from settling in and harming you when they get inside. So when it finds something foreign, it defends your body by triggering inflammation, that hot, red, swollen achiness. These symptoms can happen because the area is flooded with an army of white blood cells. The compounds they release either attack the foreign material or call in reinforcements. But the compounds that do the bulk of the attack don't just target invaders. They can harm your own cells, too. And your body can get caught in the crossfire, which causes damage and pain. Allergies, for example, are a special case of inflammation where the body is overreacting to something that's usually harmless, like pollen or dust. And autoimmune disorders come from parts of your own body triggering inflammation, like rheumatoid arthritis, where joints basically become permanently inflamed, or multiple sclerosis, where the immune system attacks the protective coating around nerves, and sometimes the nerves themselves. These conditions are becoming more common these days, especially in wealthy nations where you would think easy access to high-quality medical care would prevent them. That's where parasitic worms, collectively known as helminths, come in. This group includes things like tapeworms, nematodes, and flukes, which steal nutrients to survive. Most get cozy in another animal's intestines or blood. Some species cause pretty severe symptoms, like the worms behind schistosomiasis, which can cause anemia, liver failure, bladder cancer, or other awful conditions. But many others don't. Like, if you had a tapeworm right now, you might have no idea. Which is a super creepy thought, actually. For those more benign species, the fallout that can come from launching your immune system nukes at them can be worse than the damage from the worms themselves. Which is why some epidemiologists think that our immune systems have evolved to function with certain parasites to some extent. That might sound kind of backwards, but studies have found that rates of asthma and allergies are higher in places with fewer parasite infections, like those with more sanitation and access to healthcare. And even though treatment is obviously worth it when the worms 
toxins are causing health problems, other research has suggested that getting rid of parasites can have unintended side effects. For instance, in a 2006 study, ridding 317 children from Gabon of their intestinal parasites made some of them have an allergic reaction to mites. Similarly, a 2011 study looked at more than 2,500 Ugandan women, some of whom were treated with deworming meds while they were pregnant. While the treatment helped prevent potentially serious complications in both adults and babies, it increased the likelihood that the kids would have eczema or wheezing, both symptoms of allergic responses. And a small study of 12 multiple sclerosis patients found that those with worms had less nerve damage over time. But when four of them were treated, their multiple sclerosis symptoms got worse. It seems strange that having a parasite infection could keep you healthier in these specific ways. So to figure out why this pattern exists, immunologists have looked at how our bodies respond to helminth infections. They found that some parasitic worms seem to make our immune systems kind of hold back by releasing anti-inflammatory signals that make it so our bodies don't go overboard trying to heal the parasites. At the same time, they're also reducing the inflammation that leads to autoimmune conditions and the overreaction to allergens. Helminths could also spur the production of regulatory T cells, which recognize parts of your body that might trigger inflammation and turn down the response. These cells normally keep your immune system from staying in attack mode after the invaders are already dead, or from freaking out in response to harmless stuff like pollen. And this was seen in those 12 multiple sclerosis patients. Those with parasites had more regulatory T cells recognizing a protein that triggers the attack of neural tissue, which could be why they had less nerve damage. Doctors are trying to figure out what it is about the worms that triggers these regulatory mechanisms. That way, they might be able to turn the compounds involved into treatments for all kinds of autoimmune diseases. It would be like the benefits of the worms without all the worms. To be clear, we here at SciShow do not recommend infecting yourself with worms to try and, like, cure your tree nut allergy. Unless your doctor prescribes them, which is kind of possible. Some doctors are putting the hygiene hypothesis to the ultimate medical test clinical trials. Most of these trials are still in the early stages, and results are mixed, but some researchers remain hopeful. We already know that our health depends on tons of other organisms that live on and in our bodies, so maybe parasitic worms are just part of that. Just a lot bigger. But again, we are not recommending that you stop washing your hands or, like, walk around barefoot around a lot of human feces. Don't do that. So, sometimes having parasites is a matter of life or death. And sometimes you don't even know you have one. These little critters are pretty diverse, so I guess we can't judge a parasite by its name. But as far as the parasites are concerned, humans, birds, cats, and dogs are all just hosts. And while it's not always great to host a parasite, it is always a pleasure to host SciShow. Thank you for watching this episode of SciShow, and thank you to the Patreon community who helped make it possible for us to create videos like this one. If you want to learn more about becoming a patron, you can head over to patreon.com slash scishow.